Let's get shiny. <laughs> You're not even going to need to powder your nose for this one, so no worries. Hi, I'm Rhonda Ray. Thanks for joining me on How Many Light Bulbs Does It Take to Change a Person? Today we're going to be talking about how to use absolutely everything we've got to shine the glory of God. We're going to be zeroing in on how to really know Jesus, the light of the world. And what a treat we get to hear from my daughter and fiction co-author, by the way, Kaylee Ray, although I hear she's doing something electrical, and so I got to tell you, I'm a little nervous about that one. But I'm loving sharing some of my family with you. Andy Ray is going to be joining with us again, too, as well as The Corners. So lots of great stuff coming up here, right here on How Many Light Bulbs Does It Take to Change a Person? So I, I burn my right pointer finger not too long ago on the toaster. It's stupid toaster. It really smarted. It was like right on the very end. It probably wouldn't have been so bad, except that I kept aggravating it on everything, you know? It, do you know how many moves in life require the end of your pointer finger? It, it, a bunch of them. This was, my, this was my typing tip, and I'm a writer. It's, you know, it's, it's, that means every J and U, what is it, M, H, Y, all those stung, not to mention my sixes and my sevens. So, you know, it, it wasn't just the typing either. It was more than that. My, my little boo-boo interfered with stirring and, and tapping, zipping, poking, picking, pulling, <laughs> prodding, pinching, I don't know. And this is my lip gloss finger. So interfered with that is my microwave button pushing a finger. And, it, and it's absolutely vital for making that little violin motion, you know, when somebody's whining. Okay, I was probably the one that was whining, but still, you know, I couldn't even do my hair right. My hair. See, now this is getting serious. At least I could still point with my pointer finger, and that was good. It, you know what's really good? It's good that I always have something good and worthwhile to point too. I have something good to point out. And that's something. It's that everything in this life should point to Jesus. Yeah. And if other people are not pointed to Jesus by what I do, by what they see in my life, you know, there's only one person to blame. All fingers point back at me. <laughs> you know, Jesus is the light of the world. He crushed the darkness of sin by his redemptive work on the cross. And, and he, he gave us that light to shine. Then Jesus the light said, he said, you are the light of the world. You are. He said, a town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, he said, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's what he said in Matthew 5, 14 through 16. So yeah, no bowls about it. We have been commissioned to shine his light, all glory pointing to him. Now, listen, not that I'm one to point a finger, but... But the disciples, you know, they were not looking all too shiny just after the resurrection. In John 20, we're told they were hiding away. They were locked behind closed doors. A couple of them had already seen the empty tomb. You know, Mary told them, she had already told them that she had seen the risen Lord. Still, doors locked. <laughs> so what was it that changed the disciples from these wimpy guys hiding in that room into the bold proclaimers of truth that we see in the New Testament. Well, John 20, 19 through 22 tells us, it. it says, On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. 
And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, so Jesus didn't leave the disciples trying to muster up some light that they could shine on their own. No, he didn't leave them each pointing a finger at the other one to go. When he said in Acts 1.8, But you will receive my power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When he said that, you know what? He was commissioning them. He was commissioning us too. You know, shining his light, it's more than just a nice way to live. It's a calling. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But you are a chosen people. You were chosen to tell the world about the wonderful acts of God who were called. He, he's the one who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. If you've been called out of darkness into his light, listen, that calling is yours. And, and the Lord, he's never, ever going to call you to do something that he first does not empower you to do. If my life isn't pointing others to the Lord for his glory, to his glory, then my usefulness as far as doing anything remotely worthwhile is concerned is, it's my usefulness, it's total toast. <laughs> Just saying. So how about you? Are you shining by his power to his glory? Let's ask for it. Father, we ask for the power to shine your glory into a dark world. Let us use every ounce of energy and all the power you provide to point others to your glory. In the name of Jesus, his radiant glory, that's the point of our story. What do you put in a toaster? Bread, yes. And what do you get out of a toaster? Well, if it's this toaster, you mostly also just get bread because it's not working at all. I don't know why I keep trying to fix things like this. I do know that when I left home, a lot of really lovely people who love me very much gave me these tools so I guess I could fix things like this, but I gotta tell you, it's not happening. It's like owning a screwdriver does not make me MacGyver, which conversationally he probably wouldn't need one because he could think of something better. But in any case, I don't know why I'm even trying with this guy because to be honest, I got this at a yard sale months ago for like three bucks. And I mean, I know it's only been a few months, but I feel like he's really given me that three bucks worth of toast. So it may just be time to retire him and, dare I say it, get something new. Um, on the spiritual side, um, it can be like that too. You know, it is, it's just as ridiculous for me to try to fix me on my own. I mean, I can't do that. I have to just get new. And the only way that I can get new is Jesus. And you might have noticed too in your life, every time you try to fix something on your own and you just end up making things worse. Like it'd be like trying to fix a toaster with a hammer, which I don't even know why I have this out because that's, that's ridiculous. What are you going to do with a hammer and a toaster? It's silly. And, you know, Jesus uh, in Luke, he was telling a parable and he says, uh, No one tears a patch from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, not only will he tear the new, but also the piece from the new garment will not match the old. I love that. Jesus knows. He knows about clothes. And then he says, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins, it will spill, and the skins will be ruined. But new wine should be put into fresh wineskins. I don't have to try to fit my new life in Christ into my old life, the old soggy, stale thing. Because it wouldn't work if I tried anyway. I would burst, which, like, I may do anyway because of this toaster, except into flames. So <laughs> my mom's up next, and she's going to get a little bit more specific on how to get new in Christ. Meanwhile, I will probably be sitting here um, 
mostly trying not to combust anything, which... Oh. Did we unplug this? Thanks, Kaylee. Yeah, you, you gotta watch playing games with electricity. <laughs> of course, games, they can kind of confuse me anyway. For instance, I've always wondered why paper beats rock, because last time I threw a piece of paper at a window, nothing. <laughs> yeah, scissors cut, rock smashes, I get those, but I have a hard time feeling all that threatened by a covering. See, to me, that, that sounds more like, I don't know, getting tucked in. <laughs> I don't think a lot of crimes are committed by some guy holding a piece of paper going, don't make me cover you with this. If I invented the game, see, if I had invented it, I, I would have wanted to put something in that's, that was wimpy. Yeah, but, but I, I think I would have made, some, made it something more like pickle, because at least that's a little interesting. And you can eat it. <laughs> yeah, and while we're questioning, I also wonder why they never, they've never come up with a Trump item, you know, like laser or, or, or maybe bazooka. Bazooka annihilates rock, paper, and scissors, and also pickle. <laughs> As for our spiritual covering, yeah, no need to wonder there. Gotcha covered. If we surrender our lives to Christ, our sin, it's covered. It's covered, smashed, annihilated. Psalm 32, 1 says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are, are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Yeah, people have a tendency to, to, to try to cover their sins themselves or, or to pretend that they're not there, you know, or sometimes we like to just relabel them. You know, that's just part of my personality or that's one of my little weaknesses. But the Bible says that there's not a single one of us who doesn't have a sin problem. We've all sinned. Have you ever lied, stolen, cheated, wanted something that wasn't yours? It takes one sin to make you a sinner. The pickle of sin, see, that's no small thing. Sin entered the world with Adam and Eve when they chose to disobey God, and we've been living under the curse of it ever since. Each of us has inherited that sin nature. What does it take to annihilate sin? It takes perfection. Well, that really did leave us in a pickle because none of us is perfect. It's a very sad pe uh, pickle because so many people live a life separated from their father, the creation separated from the creator. And it, it just leaves a person always knowing that something is missing. S because it is, something big is missing. So, so what can a person do? What can a person do? That is life's biggest question of all. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our forgiveness is a gift purchased by the very blood of Christ on that cross of Calvary. Romans 5.8 says that God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we, we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So here is the perfect one taking the punishment for our sin when we couldn't. The blood of Jesus, now that trumps everything. Our salvation is not anything that we can earn. It's not a paycheck that we receive for living a good life. It's a gift. Listen, if you've never prayed, you can do that. You can do that today. Why not let today be your day of salvation? Listen, pray something like this. Ask the Lord to forgive your sin. Let him know that you know that you have sinned, you've broken his laws, and that you have no power to live a righteous life on your own. Let him know that you believe that Jesus Christ, his son, died on the cross for your sin, to pay for your sin debt, to pay for everything wrong you've ever done. Let him know that you believe that he rose again three days later, conquering sin and death once and for all. Give him your life. Ask him to forgive you, give him your life, let him have it all. So how much light does it take to change a person? <laughs> Only the light of Jesus can change us from sin covered to forgiven. Only his salvation can rescue us and can usher us in to a life that's full of light. 
If you're already a Jesus follower, listen, this is your call to have a little celebration party. Remember back to that day when you gave Jesus your all. Such blessing in that remembering. We had our first Ray wedding this year and we already love remembering the details. But Derek went from being son and brother to being family. And we celebrated every time we look at the pictures. Um, we see my son Jordan doing part of the ceremony, my husband. It's just sweet, even sweeter, remembering the radical change that happened that moment of salvation. Sin annihilated. We have been covered by the rock. Andy Ray is going to come again and, and the corners, and they're going to share some music with us and share an, another little word or two about our rock, Jesus, our rock. When the day arrives at night, my flashlight hits the floor cause I'm covered in light. It's time to shed our skin, all things are new, let's shed our skin. The life of a musician is not usually conducive to watching sunrises. Normally, I'll get up around 10.30 a.m., start driving by 11, get to the gig by 4, set up, go on, do the concert, chat with people afterwards, tear down, and then get to bed around 2 a.m. So it's easy to forget how absolutely gorgeous a sunrise can be. Something about that first light that just inspires newness, potential, a fresh start. In the life of a believer, we're all about sunrises. We who are dead in our trespasses are alive in Christ. All things are new, totally transformed. We were living in darkness, but by the grace of God, we see a glow on the horizon. His joy comes in the morning. You see, darkness makes everything difficult. You have no idea where you're coming from. You have no idea where you're heading. Nothing is illuminated. You're going to experience those times in your life, even believers. Now, the temptation is to feel abandoned by God, but it's so important to remember that the dawn comes after the nighttime. And there is a time coming when all of the old things will pass away and everything will be made new. We just haven't made it to that day yet. So stay strong, friends. We have such a hope to look forward to. The dawn is going to be so beautiful. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 16 through 20. Thanks, Andy. I never cease to be amazed and surprised at the things that he comes up with. But 
You know, my wonderful hubby also surprises me with wonderful things. He surprised me not long ago with an anniversary cruise. We're talking Hawaii, baby. Oh my goodness, it was so awesome. Seven days, seven glorious days, just the two of us. It was wonderful. And I will admit it, I am a cruise fan. Yeah, I love everything about it, especially the food. Oh my goodness. Yeah, a cruise and overeating, they go together like a hand in a glove. Well, like a size 10 hand in a size two glove. I'm just gonna tell you, cause it's all the gourmet food you can eat. I, I guess I was just asking for a trip back to maternity pants, you know, the whole time. I now refer to myself as 19 years postpartum. Thank you very much. But the staff on the ship said that the average person gains seven to 10 pounds on a cruise. But then, you know, I've always considered myself an overachiever. <laughs> on prime, uh, prime rib night, that's the big night. Prime rib night, we were walking out of the dining room and even though he was just about to let his britches out a notch or two, Richie said he was thinking about ordering yet another prime rib. I've been going, another one, really? So yeah, I, I figured that would cost him at least another notch and a half on the belt, you know. I told him that I thought that would be a mistake. Get it, mistake, you know, prime rib. You know. <laughs> well, anyway, anytime we're gonna overdo, it's good to make sure that we're overdoing in all the right areas. Going over calorie limits, yeah, you can only do that for so long. It's not a great idea to consistently overdo. But Thessalonians 4.1 talks about living right to please God. And it says, now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. It's to do and to overdo. It's an encouragement to, to keep growing. Not, not so much growing in the, you know, bring on the elastic waistbands kind of, kind of growth, but, but growing in maturity, sanctification. Paul says in verse two and three of that same chapter, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. The Amplified Bible calls that sanctification consecrated, separated, and set apart for pure and holy living. You know, we grow as we seek to stay in the light, dwelling in the presence of the Lord, making sure our lives are for Him and all about Him. Growth, it's not an option, it's a command. Verses seven and eight in that same passage in 1 Thessalonians, they say, for God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you His Holy Spirit. What a sobering thought, you know, to think that to reject His instruction and that call to live a holy life is to really reject our Father Himself. And that rejection means that we're ignoring the Holy Spirit that He gave us to help live that life. You know, we're talking mistake of the highest order here. Relying on Him results in a life in which growing a notch or two <laughs> spiritually is a regular happening. It's the good kind of growth. One where we seek that consistency and growth more diligently than anything else. It was probably one of the first things on the cruise ship didn't offer, maybe the only thing they didn't offer, but a friend was telling me about, at a restaurant about, are you ready for this? It was chicken fried bacon. Yeah, no kidding, chicken fried, I'm sorry, but I cannot imagine looking at bacon and thinking, okay, just in case there's not enough lard here, and just in case it's not quite unhealthy enough, Let's just batter this sucker and fry it again, <laughs> you know? Seriously, chicken fried bacon, who thinks up these things? Yeah, may, I thought maybe they should just roll it in Lipitor. I mean, maybe that would, you know, make the batter out of that, that seems right. I think my triglycerides are up a little every time I just say the word chicken fried bacon. <laughs> I'm thinking they'd probably need to serve it with a side order of crash cart. <laughs> 
it'll probably surprise you that, that the whole thing made me think about the privilege of prayer. Prayer is about helping us to see things God's way, to help us put on His mind. Deuteronomy 4.29 says to seek the Lord your God and you will find Him if you seek Him with all your heart and with all your soul. Lord, make us hungry to become hungrier. Light the way for more and more. You know, there's nothing more exciting to me than seeing someone become a follower of Christ and learn how to pray to Him. If you prayed that prayer, let me be the first to welcome you into the kingdom. If you've been celebrating with us, you know, uh, let me just celebrate with you more and more as we walk in the light. Well, we've looked at shining His glory. We've talked about the light of salvation, and we've done some thinking on what it means to live in the light and, and to dwell in His presence. Next time, we're going to be talking about how to find strength to walk in the light even when you're not feeling any too strong. Kaylee will be back, and my mom says that she's going to be doing some clowning around. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know I don't like clowns. I know you fear clowns. Wait, no. That's not a good. So now you know you don't want to miss this. The Corners and Andy Ray have some especially helpful ministry for us, too. All that and more next time on How Many Light Bulbs Does It Take to Change a Person? A little extra light for the path. Psalm 89.15 says, Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, Lord. See you for the next session.